Hello, this is Howard Kane. Hopefully quite a few of you enjoyed Mike's Wildlife Week last week and might even have been lucky enough to take part in a guided walk around the new Manx BirdLife Point of Air National Reserve, which it's hoped will open to the public later this summer. If you missed that, then stay with me now, as last autumn I was the guest of Mike's BirdLife for a private tour of the reserve with some of the key players in its creation. And over the next 25 minutes, I'll try and give you a little taste of what it's like in a short radio ramble. You won't even need your wellies. Finally here, Howard. Finally here, yes. It's only taken ten years. <laughs> so after something of a prolonged wait, bearing in mind we were talking about this at least a decade ago, maybe even longer than that, a decade and a half, I don't know, we have come right up to the very north of the island towards the point of air. Uh, people know up there, of course, and where the lighthouse is to meet up and take a look. Well, we'll hear more in a moment from uh, our guests we have with us paddling or showing us around here today, uh, just starting with Neil Morris. And, um, well, it's been, we were just saying, it's been quite a time before we actually got up here. This has been a long-term project. It's been a long way to treat for us all, yes. Uh, it's taken a while to get all the legalities sorted, but we're well underway now. And uh, David, who's the site manager up here, has started quite a number of projects in terms of making the site better for wildlife and also preparing it for, for visiting. So just give us a, a, a sort of brief potted history then, or give us a bit more of where we are, because I've been saying we're right up, people know the point of air, they know where the lighthouse are, we're basically sort of just off there at what was what an old, um, an old tipping site, an old aggregate site? An old aggregates quarry. So we're just inside the headland. We, we can see the lighthouse of the Point of Air behind us. And you're in an area where island aggregates have taken a lot of the gravel and sand out of the ground. We're also surrounded by the old community landfills as well, um, two of which have been capped and nature is returning there. But we're just about to walk into the Point of Air National Reserve, which is essentially centred around a huge lagoon which has been quarried out and has now filled with a uh, water table and rainfall. Terrific. Right, well, we'll march on a bit further forward then and see what we can see. This is going to be like a seated platform, is it? Or Yes, it'll be like a reception area, so we'll have some paths through here, we'll have a few feature sculptures, we'll have more information to orient to you as you enter the reserve. And then there'll also be an observation platform on the corner here, where you can look down at what we call Dragon Alley. It's an area that's been created for dragonflies, we'll have a look at that in a minute. And then you've got the path to our right here, which leads on down into the nature reserve. That's terrific, and we can see it's sort of scoped out here with some sticks and posts just to give an idea of where the work's actually going to go. Um, just thinking of the site itself then, like I said, it has been a long time coming and uh, it's been an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes over that time. So is it now, I assume you were happy to talk about it now, so it, it is a sort of what like a long-term lease now? How does it work? It is, it's a long-term lease with the landowners Island Aggregates. And the idea is that as more quarrying works finish, that land too will be added into the nature reserve. So it'll grow incrementally over time. And there's probably a 30 to 50 year time scale before the whole site is finished as a commercial entity and it can all be turned over for nature. We're working on the first 105 acres now and the job is to make it as good as we can, get people in to enjoy wildlife and really set a standard that the other areas can then aspire to as they come into the leaseholding. And it's one of those fascinating things, isn't it? I suppose it's not completely unheard of, but this idea you've got sort of heavy industry, as it were, in the aggregates right next door to a site here, which is going to be purely for conservation and nature. Yes, we, we, we accept that decisions were taken many years ago that this is the area where the island could most cost-effectively acquire its aggregates um, for the construction industry. The island doesn't import aggregates and it doesn't export these aggregates. These are all used locally. So that decision has been taken. And then the, the second best decision we can take is to restore it for nature once that industrial work has finished. 
and I suppose it, it, from that point of view, as you say, it's the fact that it can be restored because it's those of a certain age coming up here when everything was still active and the sites, you had the right spits north and east and the tipping sites. Yes, it was, or it could be a bit pretty industrial looking, whereas now we're going to claim some of it back for nature, I guess. Yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll never have enough material to put back into the areas of excavation, so those will always remain as low-lying areas, many of them filling up with water. But the idea is to get the rest of the area, the, the capped landfill site, we've got Wright's Pit North behind us, which is the last active landfill, to blend those seamlessly back into the rest of the Ayres NNR, so that you have this one contiguous ecological unit all the way effectively from Ramsey North through to Jerby um, in the west. I'm David Andrews, I'm the Reserve Manager for Manx Bird Life. Um, I've been here about three, just towards three years now. Um, I was working previously for the RSUB up in Scotland and uh, saw the job advertised here and came across for the, for the role to take it on as a new project. So it's, it is something you need to sort of, I suppose, you do need a vision to actually see how this place is going to be. You can see as we're walking around now, various bits of, you know, we've got marker posts, we've got fence posts coming in. It's an idea of sort of sculpting out the, the, the framework, as it were, the skeleton of what's going on first and then filling it in. Yeah, to a certain extent, we have, we have a long-term plan, we've, um, something I've put in place. Um, it's, the first focus is always going to be the wildlife, but to get people in as well. We need to be able to screen the world off so that that's not disturbed, but also keep the people safe and on track. So it's very much a plan of uh, infrastructure that's going to help facilitate people to see the wildlife while keep, keeping the wildlife safe. And so do you sort of spend full time working here? Yeah, so it's a full time role. I'm, I'm based here and uh, unfortunately it's not In all weathers? Here. <laughs> well, unfortunately there's quite a bit of office work involved as well, unfortunately. And it would be nice to be out here every day, but uh, that's not possible. And how does it compare this sort of uh, this sort of project with the work you've done in the past in the UK? Yes, yeah, so similarly, I've always worked on reserves, um, so quite a lot of experience of that. There's this this kind of thing restoring um, old agricultural um, uh, gravel pits to back to wildlife is becoming quite commonplace in the UK. Um, so it's, it's it's new for here, but it's it's quite a common experience in the UK. And is it difficult balancing act on the on the one hand because you've I can see on one partly we're reclaiming the land you're having to do the landscaping but equally at the same time presumably you've got to try and encourage the wildlife or make sure we're not doing anything to actually upset the wildlife who are already using the area yeah that, that is about it's important we do get people in to see the wildlife because if people can't can't see that and can't understand what's going on it's difficult for them to to care about it um but the wildlife does come first it, it is a nature reserve uh, for, for the wildlife so but that's easily easy enough done. You can put structures in place. A lot of the work we've done so far is all about that, putting those structures in place that uh, the wildlife can uh, can live as it wants to, but people can still see it. And work-wise, uh, I mean, obviously you're here working full time. I'm taking it you won't be doing it all single-handed. No, we have um, we have uh, lots of volunteers as well. So we have a, a group that comes in uh, once a month at the weekend, and then other individuals that come and help. And it's obviously not all just me. We have uh, contractors in place as well who come and can do, do work for us um yes yeah, so it's 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 good to involve there's a group of volunteers here who will get stuck in as well and will this be over managed or overseen by manx bird life yes yeah, so it's a manx bird life project um and we will continue to oversee that in partnership with the with our aggregates and uh, we also get advice from the rspb as well Right, we've come a bit further down then, Neil, we can see one of the ponds. So give us an outline, we're just chatting to David there, give us an outline of actually what is going to be created here, because we're talking about various sort of dubs or ponds and the landscaping. What sort of areas are we trying to create here? Lots of different areas, a whole mosaic of different dry, wet, low and high habitats. Um, it's very efficient to quarry somewhere in straight lines with flat bottoms. Um, Nature doesn't like that. Nature likes lots of complexity. So what we're doing retrospectively is creating a lot more complexity into the system. So where there are straight lines, we're bending them. Where there are straight, steep uh, sides to these embankments here, we're making them more complex. 
So the more different wet, dry, high, low, sunny, sheltered, cold, warm areas you can provide, the more niches you're providing for different biodiversity to pack into the site. And when it comes to doing this sort of restoration work here, I suppose the interesting thing is obviously we are where we are and that we are taking working on an old industrial site which has been quarried and the aggregates have been taken here for a number of years. Are we trying to sort of put it back as to how it might have been before there'd been quarrying or are we sort of creating a new habitat? It's a new habitat. It's a secondary habitat um, in the main. So we don't have enough materials to fill the areas that have been excavated. So those, those deep excavated areas will remain. They're filling up with water and it's providing this secondary freshwater wetland habitat. It is, of course, surrounded by these higher areas, and what we're trying to do is seamlessly bring in and blend the heathland from around us. You've got the Airs N and R to the west, you've got the lighthouse heathland to the east, and we're trying to seamlessly blend that in as a primary habitat into the secondary habitat that has then been created and left behind after the industrial activity. And then species-wise, I mean, do you think we have different species using this area now, whether they're migratory or actually staying here, feeding here, than we would have had had it not been used for industry? Absolutely. So if, if it had been left as heathland, uh, so if you're familiar with the areas then and are that wonderful open flat stretch of heathland, um, then you would have had a set of biodiversity, um, a single set across the airs. But with this new scrubland and the freshwater habitats that are being created, probably we're adding in another 50 species to the environment here across the year and certainly in terms of breeding species we, we could add another 20 species in as well so by creating albeit a secondary habitat but by creating a new habitat you're bringing in new biodiversity which is fascinating isn't it because of both to the layman's ears you think well it seems almost a paradox doesn't it off the back of heavy industry and something which you normally conservationists and nature lovers would think oh that's the last thing we want to see we could long term actually see more biodiversity uh, yes yes indeed i mean we certainly wouldn't be advocating for ripping up the <laughs> the nnr heathland but this area has been designated for excavation that is what has happened and so the the secondary habitat that is now developing it is not the original habitat we'll never go back to the original habitat but it is a highly valuable habitat and it has a, a particular ecology in terms of the nature of the water that's here the nature of the the shingle and sand under underneath our feet which creates a unique habitat in the context of the isle of man i know unique is very often overused, overused and yeah. abused but truly here, the assemblage of organisms from birds to butterflies to the plant life is truly unique as an assemblage within the Isle of Man context because this, the ecology of the system here itself is unique within the Isle of Man. Uh, I'm Alison Leonard. I'm the Managing Director of Manx Bird Life. And this is something, I know you've been up here before, something very exciting project, I suppose, from BirdLife's point of view. It's incredibly exciting. It gives us a real opportunity to, you know, do something for nature on the Isle of Man. Um, you know, there's huge potential here for both the, the nature, but also for the people, which we also have to consider. So, yeah, it's, it's incredibly exciting. Have you worked on similar projects like this before? Yeah, so my background, um, similar to David, I've come from working on reserves in Scotland. Um, so, yeah, I've done things like this before I worked on a, a gravel pits in Cambridgeshire years and years and years ago so as David said it's not a new technique it's not something that's new in the UK but it's it's new here on the Isle of Man so it's yeah we're, we're very excited that we're the ones that are actually going to get to do it. So I suppose coming and working in, in those sort of areas and up in Scotland you'll recognise a lot of the I suppose I always think the Isle of Man's a bit like Scotland in miniature. It is yeah it's um yeah very similar um very similar species um but different enough that you know it's 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 special in its own way and then from BirdLife's point of view because of course rebranded a while back manx bird atlas originally this all obviously forms part of the work done by manx bird life generally does the, the actual database work for manx bird life where it first started out coming out with the book after five years that that sort of all goes on in the background yeah we're still very much uh, collecting all that data so um 
yeah, we've got all of the data from Manx Bird Atlas. I think it was over 600,000 records in that first five years. We've, we're still building on that. So every year we get probably another 120,000 records from people for you know, various sightings across the island that they can submit to us. But also through our Garden Bird Watch scheme, where people send us you know weekly records of what they see in their garden, which is just as important as some of the work we're doing here. Because we've got to remember, you know, it's not all about the big glamorous birds, but we exactly. want to know what's happening with the little songbirds in our gardens as well. And some of those have been under threat in recent years. Yeah, um, so our Garden Bird Watch has been running for 20 years now and we're actually just in the process of analysing all of that data and it's a huge amount of data. But some of the trends that it's showing us are quite frankly terrifying you know some of the species that we've lost things like yellow hammer where we've pretty much lost them as a bird on the isle of man um other species you know a massively declined green finch have shown massive declines over that 20 years and if it wasn't for people you know submitting those di- those records you know weekly we wouldn't know things like that and do we have any steer at the moment on to why they have had declined or disappeared? Are we talking habitat loss? Are we talking pollution? Are we talking other sort of a global warming influences? Do we have any idea? It's it's probably a mixture of all of those things. So yeah, the habitat loss is a massive uh, issue for a lot of species. Um, climate change, yet our, our climate is changing. Uh, it's getting we're getting more and more storms in the summer. It's warmer. That has an impact on you know for the insect eaters. You know when those are they're available. Disturbance is a big issue as well. We're all you know getting out more walking the dogs going to these places which is great we want people to engage with nature and enjoy it but in a responsible way um so yeah there's probably not one thing that's impacting them all it's unfortunately just lots of little things and then you've got things like um avian flu which has had a massive Mm. impact on our seabirds and our, our wildfowl over the last couple of years it's all just yeah happening at the same time OK, we've just come a little bit further up the track and uh, some work going on here. So it's stood by a barrier here, which is, looks like it's fairly recently erected, uh, with a, a nice good solid wood top on, looking out over a semi-flooded area in front of us. So what's this space here then, David? So this is the old uh, lagoon left over from when the quarry company excavated all the, ag- the aggregate and the gravel. Um, it's a, a big body of water, sort of straight sides, uh, steep edges. And we've done a lot of work in there to increase the complexity in there and to create more more edge. Um, we've put some new islands in. Um, we've shallowed off the edge. Um, what we want to create is a lot of different niches, a lot of different um, areas where different species can get in to increase that biodiversity. So we want shallow water as well as deep water. We want a lot of edges. We want sheltered bits. We want uh, bits that are open to the wind. Um, and we've done that by um, taking uh, some by creating new ponds, digging out new areas and using that to build these islands and to shallow off the edges and create bays and little bits where uh, all different types of things can get in there, all different habitats within uh, the landscape. So it's a bit like building your garden pond but on a giant scale? Yeah, very much. And um, one of the things we have here is the water levels change quite a bit. So by having those long shallow edges, whatever height the water level is at, we've got shallow water, we've got deep water, um, we've also put in, um, you'll see on the left hand side there, a big bank which um, helps screen visitors when they come in so we don't get any disturbance on that area. Um, obviously this is all very new at the moment, it's going to take a few years to vegetate up. Uh, but once that does, we're going to have a um, hope this area will really bring in a lot more wildlife. And the water here, this is all just natural so this is just left for natural rainfall? Yeah, it's, it's groundwater mainly, so there's no streams to come in, there's no uh, rivers, it's rainfall or uh, the groundwater that comes, flows off the hills and flows out this way. So we have no control over the water levels and it does vary quite a bit. Um, but it's I know I've been up here when it's been really incredibly yeah. flooded. Yeah, uh, it, it does. And so, I mean, we've had, it's noticeable this winter, it's been quite, the, the water's quite level at the, uh, quite low at the moment. Um, uh, a couple of winters ago, it was really wet, um, so it, it is varying a lot in the in the three years I've been here. It's really varied. And actually, just looking out when you're talking about the landscaping, the design when you're actually designing something on this scale is this sort of done by committee or is it all handed over to you as the project manager? How does that work? So we've had advice. We've had um, 
the RSPB ecologists have been over and had a look and we've, we've had advice from them but uh, between them and ourselves as, as Manx BirdLife we've come up with this design and there's a basic design there but it doesn't have to be perfect we want what we want is um rough edges we want it does, it's not like a, a landscaped yeah. perfect yeah. garden we want rough edges so we have the basic in, uh, structure there and then the rest can be uh, nature can bash it around a bit and make it make those little niches and then sort of longer term as you say once this vegetates up and obviously it will change you can see it's been worked quite recently but it, i'm sure like a lot of things it'll be amazing how quickly this will completely change and be taken over by the vegetation coming back what sort of species in these sort of habitats are we hoping to attract and encourage a lot of this is about providing uh cover so around the edges we'll hopefully get a lot more emergent vegetation coming up um a kestrel going past there Ooh. um oh yeah so that will then provide uh cover for things like invertebrates uh, we'll get the younger fish going in which then provides uh, food or, or for the for the largest for the birds from the ducks uh, it also provide cover for the for the ducks to get in the nest and the islands are good for the ground nesting birds a lot of the areas birds in this area are aggressive underground and really struggle with predation um, so by putting islands in or we have a couple of um, you see on the corner there a couple of uh, rafts mm -hmm. that's effectively artificial islands it just provides a little bit of extra protection for the ground nesting birds to help them get their young away Well, this is a bit handy as we go right up towards the top end and there is a wonderful hiding place already. Uh, I'll just go in and take a look here. Oh yes. Uh, this is very nice. So you've got a lovely viewing windows all the way down one side and at both ends which will open out on nice days and close up with the winds lashing in and the rains coming in. And you've got a great view out over the lagoon in front here. I wish we'd been walking along alongside adjacent to it coming down this far side. Very nice too. What have we got out here today then, Alison? So we've got um, a few ducks. We've got some tufted duck, some coots. Uh, there's quite a large flock of feral greylag -gre geese as well that spend quite a lot of time here on the reserve. Um, and actually on the far bank, you can see we've actually got a couple of chuff feeding on the grass over there as well, which is nice. Oh yes, just on the far side there. How oh, wonderful. Right, I'll get me on binoculars out and take a look. So in the hide at the top end there, and uh, you can see this is going to be a great resource, people coming here, space for a lot of people to come actually and sit in relative comfort in the dry and uh, watch the birds in the fullness of time. And a um, fair amount of work for you, David, to actually get this one up. It's uh, it's a good size hide. Yeah, the majority of this work was done by contractors and then we're, we're finishing it off ourselves just to get it in up to how we want it to be. Um, you see it's still a work in progress, but we're getting there. This will be open when the whole site opens, uh, and this will be the main viewing area for people who are visiting. Well, there we go, just closing up. So it's taken a few years then, Anil, but we have eventually got here a well well worth a visit thanks very much indeed for showing us around today um great pleasure and it is it's just an amazing sight you must be very excited to see it actually taking shape oh it's very exciting i mean it's a long-term project so we'll do our bit we'll set the standard and then it'll, it'll be for future generations to finish it off but um what an amazing legacy for the island and, and we do have to say thank you to the wonderful volunteers who've helped us uh, island aggregates rspp they've all had a, an input which has helped us do it faster and do it better so we're very grateful it's it's been a real community effort um great support from government at the start of this project um a lot of organizations on the island have helped as well and if we can keep everybody engaged um all hands to the mill as they say then um, we can keep going and keep developing this amazing place